Welcome to Church in Region Pray. We love you. We miss you. Hope to see you guys soon. I'm back from India and hope to see you all soon. Bye. broken. You made it known through history. Your love will never be unfaithful. Never walk out of me. Never walk out of me. I have no reason to doubt you. Who you have been, you'll always be. And though the future's still unfolding, everything I've seen, how could I not believe?
it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives within me, Christ who lives within me, from beginning to the be afraid every time I face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. And I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roar. I don't want to fear the storm. No, I don't want to fear the storm. gonna be afraid cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid no I'm not gonna be afraid and I'm not gonna fear the storm you are greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm no I'm not gonna fear it all
You know, here at church in Regent Park, we always want to put a smile on your face. And we have lots of events that are going to keep you happy this Easter. Your kids will be smiling about the Easter boxes that Pastor Kim is preparing. But you don't want to turn this smile upside down by not getting one. So please reach out at the contact info below to ensure your family gets one. We are... Spending time together this Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. It was great to see Monica and Sonia's smiling faces for the first time. And we'd love to have you connect as we discuss Easter with Pastor J.D. Greer. And lastly, we are uh, remembering Good Friday together on Zoom at 10 a.m. We're going to be worshiping with Family Worship and Outreach Center, one of our partners in Curtis. And I'll be sharing the word and we'd love to have you join us. And if you're not sure how to do that, then you can also reach out and we can help you get connected. As we celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection, we're going to be taking communion. So be prepared for that. And we hope you enjoy tonight's message in the Why Easter series. celebrate uh, Palm Sunday and, and Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem with millions of Christians around the world who will be celebrating that this weekend. And we're so glad that you've tuned in from wherever you are and uh, you're worshiping with us tonight. Welcome to any guests that may be joining us for the first or second time. We're glad that you're here. It's a great church located in Regent Park and we're looking forward to reopening in the near future and we're making plans to to find a location that, uh, that we can worship together soon. And we've been looking through a series that we've entitled, Why Easter? Just dealing with some of the questions that you may have, some questions that maybe your friends and family have asked about Easter and why we celebrate the way we do. The first week we looked at where does the word Easter come from and why is it so, so important to Christians? And last week we talked about why is the cross so important? I mean, it's such a bloody, tragic graphic account of what happened to Jesus and why is it something that we need to spend so much time focusing on and the answer is well scriptures discuss how Jesus died and it's just evidence of this plan that God had thousands of years in, in advance of Jesus coming to, to earth it also just is an important way that God demonstrated his love for you and his love for me and also it brings us near to God and we're going to shift our focus a little bit and we're going to look at the drastic change that takes place with those that watch Jesus' triumphal entry, the crowd that was there that day. And then just a couple days later, how the popularity swung in a very different direction. At one day, they're celebrating Jesus' arrival. And a couple of days later, there's a drastic turnaround and they're beginning to celebrate his death and shout crucify him. They went from shout shouting save us now to crucify him. And we're going to discuss why that took place. You are watching another church at Regent Park Saturday service quarantine edition. <laughs> we uh, got notice a couple days ago that uh, someone in Kyla's class, who's our daughter, and someone in Ashton's class has COVID as a result. Their classes have been sent home and they're on quarantine. They're going to be tested on Monday and thankfully there's no symptoms and we're praying for those students that do have COVID and their families. But it's some difficult news for a 15-year-old or a 13-year-old or a 9-year-old to receive that you're going back to school online and you can't see your friends and you can't go to the mall and you can't celebrate your birthday and you can't go to youth group. And so there's some frustration. There's a little bit of anxiety about uh, being tested. There's disappointment that plans have gotten changed. And so Pastor Kim had a great idea. Let's invite John. 
Not John Murray, who lives at 40 Oak Street, or not John Gray, who comes most Saturdays and, and uh, gives out some of his clothes that, uh, to, to those in need. Another John, a Papa John. Kim, in her wisdom, invited Papa John to make an appearance on, Thursday, on Friday, and it brought some cheer and some encouragement to those that were disappointed and frustrated. So it kind of helped sway the tide. It, it went from one extreme of frustration and discouragement to encouragement, and let's make the best of it, and let's celebrate Kyla's birthday the best way we can in a very different way. And we see a very drastic change take place in the life of Jesus between Palm Sunday and between Good Friday. And we're going to look closely at, at what brought about this change. And we see it in our world almost on a daily basis, that one tweet, one post, one rumor can drastically change public opinion of someone's life. Sometimes things that need to be exposed come to light. Sometimes there's injustice, there's crimes, there's assaults that, that come to light. And sometimes there are things, rumors that turn to be unfounded. And we want to be people of truth and grace. We want to follow Jesus' example. And we want to stand up for those that are being uh, persecuted, those that are experienced prejudice, those that wrong has been done to. But we also want to do it with facts. So we want to wait for the truth to come out. And we want to help people reconcile and, and make changes in their life and come to faith and, and growth through Jesus. And so we should be people that stand up against hate and abuse, inequality. We should see those things defeated in our world. But people's lives can be ruined by one comment or one rumor. And so we also want to be people that, that seek out the truth and know the truth before we pass judgment. We want to stand with our uh, Asian Canadian friends who have experienced a lot of hatred in North America over the last couple of weeks. We want to see one incident took place very recently in our community at Girard and Ontario Street, just a stone throw where some of you live that someone wrote um, racist slurs uh, on that wall. And so we don't condone racism as a church and as followers of Christ. We want to stand up for those that are, are being uh, hated and are experiencing abuse. So we continue on and we see some of the abuse that Jesus endured for you, endured for me. And so let's read Matthew 21 together. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what the prop was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a colt, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I believe the first thing, that I read here is that the king is here. In previous years, we've looked at John's account of the triumphal entry. We've looked at Luke's account of the triumphal entry. And today we're just going to spend Matthew's account. And he says the king is here. He's emphasizing what the Old Testament, the old scriptures had to say about the coming chosen one. The fulfillment of, of Zechariah 9.9 is here. That's the one that discusses the daughter of Zion. We find a difference in Matthew's account than we do in some of the other uh, Gospels. 
he recognizes that there's two animals here, that there's a mother and there's a colt. Now, some people who are critics of Scripture say, well, this is a contradiction. Well, no, it's just Matthew gives us more information than the other gospel writers do. He says, well, there are two animals. There's a colt, but the mother also came along. And so it's not a contradiction. It's not pointing out that the Scripture is not inspired. And we see as the, Matthew continues that, that this colt hadn't been ridden, that there was no saddle, that, that people put the cloaks on the back of the animal. And Matthew writes about this, and we see that, that this is a special colt for a special sacred purpose. That this was a practice that we see throughout Scripture. In 2 Kings 9.13, Jehu had similar treatment. This is also what they did for Simon, uh, Simon Maccabeus when he entered Jerusalem after one of his most notable victories. And so this was a common practice to do for a leader, for a king. They shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right out of Psalm 18, 25 to 26. They shouted, Hosanna, which means save us. Save us, son of David, which is a title that's used for the Messiah that has a, a kingly description that would only be used for the chosen one that was coming to save Israel. And so the crowd recognized that Jesus was this king that they were hoping would come. People who didn't know who Jesus was said, who is this? And they said, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15 talks about a prophet that would come. And Jesus is the one that they've been waiting for. We learn that there's a very large crowd. It was likely before Passover, and Jerusalem was just packed with people. There likely were two million people in the city. And friends, this is the only time, the only time that Jesus sets it up for them to recognize that he is the king. There are other times where we try to keep things private, or he said, go, but don't tell anyone quite yet. My time has not come. This is the moment where his time had come for the people to recognize him as the king that God would send into the world. People are still asking, who is this? Who is this Jesus? There are more people in our city and in our neighborhoods and in our communities asking who Jesus is than maybe ever before in our nation's history. This is a time of year where the focus is on Jesus and we want to represent him well we want to have courage and invite people to tune in and to watch and to learn about what Jesus has done. And so be sensitive to who God would have you to invite and encourage this Easter season. In Matthew 27, we see a very different reaction to Jesus. Why is the reaction so different? What has changed in just a matter of days? Well, let's read Matthew 27 before uh, we end our time together. Starting at verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Who are you, the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Do you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it's the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they handed him over to Jesus. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message do not have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. But Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere. 
But instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. He said, this is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Firstly, we saw that the king is here. And secondly, the king is near. There's a group of leaders they were called the Sanhedrin. There were 70 Jewish men who would meet and make a lot of decisions in Jerusalem. And they were behind the arrest of Jesus. He was accused of blasphemy, which is showing disrespect to something holy. But the Romans didn't care about that. They didn't have any time for the Jewish religion. And so the, the Sanhedrin had to come up with some charges that Romans did, would care about. And so they charged him with treason. They charged him with terrorism. They tried to charge him with tax evasion. And that was something that was gathering the Romans' attention. He's asked, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, you have said so. He's asked again about the charges and he doesn't give an answer. And Jesus is perfect. And so he says, it is as you have said, because he had made claims like that. And so he didn't want to tell a lie and sin. But in the same sense, he didn't see the need to defend himself. I mean, this is what he had been waiting since the creation of the world to do. To come in and, and bring people closer to God. So why draw it out? Why make a defense? This is what he knew God the Father desired to take place. And so he doesn't defend himself. In fact, he fulfills another prophecy in Isaiah 53, 7, that he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The Life Application Commentary says, sometimes the best witness to people surrounded by secular power is quiet confidence in a power much higher much greater, much deeper. They may not understand it, but they do notice. And so Pilate notices Jesus' response. And friends, when we represent Jesus well, when we don't resort to hating those that hate us, when we don't respond to hate with hate, but when we respond with love, when we don't respond to violence with, but with peace, that people take notice when we don't seek out revenge, when we don't throw insults and offenses back, when we're calm, when others are enraged, people notice our response. And that's what we see here with Pilate and his wife. There's something different about Jesus. That he doesn't respond like a prisoner or a criminal or another revolutionary would. Pilate is performing this custom, probably to help woo the Jewish people, to like the Roman leadership better, that they would release one prisoner during the Passover. And so Pilate thinks he is doing Jesus a favor. He saw and he's heard about the, the triumphal entry. And he says, you know what? I'm going to turn the tables on the Sanhedrin here. They're trying to force my hand. They're trying to get me to convict this innocent man. I'm going to show them. I'm going to put this innocent man in front of the people and they're going to set him free well he must have been astonished to see that the opposite took place that instead of letting jesus the messiah go they want to crucify him someone that they just celebrated a couple days earlier and instead they want to release jesus barabbas some of the earliest manuscripts have jesus barabbas and the niv the one that we're reading with tonight uses some of those early manuscripts. They've actually just found some more in the Dead Sea not too, just a couple of days ago, affirming that scripture hasn't changed throughout the hundreds of years, but it's the same as it was originally recorded. But this Jesus Barabbas, his name means son of the father. And so maybe he was the son of a famous rabbi. The word that we learn about more in Matthew and, and Luke and John is that he was a robber. But the word can also mean revolutionary. It can also mean re like a rebel. And Josephus often used the word as a revolutionary, as a rebel, describing 
the, the violent groups of rebels that would fight against the Romans on behalf of the Jewish people. Thievery wasn't a capital offense. And so it's possible that, that Jesus Barabbas was actually, may have committed murder, maybe have robbed people, but he was, he was also a leader of rebellion. That he was involved in, in having people rebel against the Roman, which is something the Romans fought very strongly against. Maybe the two thieves on the left and the right of Jesus were, were compatriots of Jesus Barabbas, who was about to be in the middle of them until the crowd set him free. On Palm Sunday, the group that welcomed Jesus the Messiah were really looking for Jesus Barabbas. They were looking for a military leader. They were looking for someone that was going to lead a rebellion to get rid of the Romans. And that is what we see here, that instead of, of releasing Jesus, the Messiah, the one that would set people free from their sins and bring them back to God, they would rather kill an innocent man and have Jesus Barabbas go free instead. It mentions Pilate out of self-interest. Well, he has no love for the Sanhedrin. He has no love for the religious leaders. And, and so he uses the word Messiah intentionally, knowing that it would just drive them crazy. He's met soldiers and politicians and prisoners, and there's nothing like this Jesus that he has in front of him. Verse 20 says, The chief priests and the elders persuaded or convinced the crowd. Conceivably, there were some people that were there at both events, at the Palm Sunday triumphal entry, and also here on Good Friday. But he's worried about his job. He's worried that religious leaders are going to complain to his bosses. There is some historical accounts that talk about the fact that he was worried about being impeached. And so here he's in a tough situation. He wants to let Jesus the Messiah go. But he can't risk making the religious leaders even more mad and, and having him re recalled to Rome and, and losing his position. Winston Churchill once asked, Does it thrill you? To know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing. He says it's quite flattering, but whenever I feel that way, I always remember that as instead of making a big political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. And it appears to be the case here that the crowd is twice as big, wanting to see Jesus crucified instead of Jesus celebrated. Pilate's done what he ha could, or so it seems. He washes his hands, which is a Jewish custom, not a Roman one. I mean, he's tried to set Jesus free because he doesn't want to break Roman law and have an innocent man crucified. His wife warned him about Jesus. He even tried to let Jesus go by sending him to, t to Herod and having him be whipped instead tried to give him back to the Jewish leaders, but at the end of the day, he, pressure, he feels pressured over his job, over his opinion, and he agrees to let an innocent man be killed. And this is the saddest part of it all. At the heart of this change in popular opinion was it was influenced by 70 leaders who were worried about the position who were worried about losing their power, who were losing about their comfort that their position brought, and instead they influenced the crowd. They influenced the Roman curator. And as a result, Jesus was crucified. All the people shouted, His blood is on us and on our children. And unfortunately, in the 70 AD, just a couple decades Later, the second temple was destroyed, that Jerusalem was under siege, led by revolutionaries, maybe just like Jesus Barabbas. Josephus says 1.1 million people were killed. Now, some modern-day critics say that's impossible, but that, that's the historical record, that the blood was shed. 
and the blood of future generation was spilled. But what is the hope? Why is this an encouraging story? Why can we still celebrate the triumphal entry? Well, Jesus came to be the king of your life and of my life. And although the crowd was swayed, although the crowd's opinion was changed, it didn't change Jesus' position. That he came to die. Although he was innocent, he made no defense, he fulfilled scripture and he gave his life to bring us near to God. Many of you will remember a couple years ago, church in Wellesley, there was a young woman that climbed this enormous crane and she slid down the ropes and she sat in the scoop. Someone had to go rescue her. Someone had to risk their life. Someone had to, to come into that difficult situation to help that woman to safety. His name was Rob Wanfor. Very humble. He said, you know what? Any one of us firefighters would have gone into danger to save her life. And he climbed up that crane. And he slid down and rappelled down. And he picked her up and he carried her to safety. She went on to be charged with six and they were reduced to two charges but that gentleman risked his life. And friends, that's very illustrative of what Jesus did for us. That although he wasn't recognized as king on that day, although they shouted crucify him instead of save me now, that Jesus came into this world so that we could put our trust in him and be brought near to God. The hope in this account is the king has come and can be trusted. There are times when we think we know best, but the king knows best. There are times when leaders or crowds lead us away, but the king knows best. There are times when we're afraid and don't know what to do, but the king knows best. When leaders fail and lead you astray, the king is here. When your social networks give you false information and are full of toxic emotions, the king is here. When you don't know how to navigate a difficult situation, the king is here. They were looking for a king to arrive on a colt. They were looking for a king that would come and deliver them what they wanted. Maybe on an e-bike. That they would, they would have something Ubered in. That they wanted a king that would just give them whatever they wanted have it delivered to their door, that they can make all the choices. But what we remember on Palm Sunday is Jesus came in a way that he saw fitting, in a method of peace, talking about a spiritual revolution. And when we put our trust in him, when we say, I don't need to make all the decisions, I don't need to have a king that fits my desires and my opinions, I'm going to bow down to the king who knows what's best for me, who can be trusted. That is a relationship that changes our life. And that is why we remember how the crowd went from celebrating a king who disappointed them to celebrating a king who can be trusted and could fulfill our needs and our desires beyond what we could ever ask and think. And so we can celebrate, we can be full of joy that the king is near and the king is has come and he's with you and he protects you and he watches over you. And I invite you to pray a prayer and just say, Jesus, I believe you are the king. I believe you died and you rose again and I want to trust you with my life because what you do is best and what you know is best and that you are here. So listen to him this week and have him guide you to the decisions and situations that you're going to face this week. Let's close our time in prayer. Lord, thank you that although that crowd misunderstood why he would come to earth, we pray that we wouldn't have the same response, that we'd recognize that you are here and you are near, and as a result of your death, that you have brought us near to God. And so guide us, direct us, 
Help us know what truth is. Help us have an understanding of what it means to represent you well in 2021. May we stand up for those that are oppressed, for those that are facing racism, for those that are poor, for those that have experienced abuse. Lord, that we would follow you with courage and we would help those that are in need. We pray for Vivian, that you bring healing to her body as she has had a fall. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Sonia's sister, Jenny, who uh, is not well and, and in, in a medical care at the moment. We also pray that you would guide us and direct us as we seek to reopen, that you would provide the building and the place that you would give us favor, or that you would continue to protect us and watch over us. And we're thankful and we celebrate how you came to earth and you gave your life for us. In your name we ask and we pray. Amen. Well, happy Easter. Thank you for being with us this week. And we have a great group that meets Wednesday. We're going to continue looking deeper at what Jesus did for us. We hope that you'll join us. time I face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. And I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roar. I don't want to fear the storm. No, I don't want to fear the storm. gonna be afraid cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid no I'm not gonna be afraid and I'm not gonna fear the storm you are greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm no I'm not gonna fear it all in me.